Namaste. <laughs> I'm having a blast with music and graphics and playing all kinds of different tunes to the five-syllable mantra. I hope you're enjoying it. hope you're having as much fun with it as I do. Uh, it's another beautiful evening here. The day just flies by. I don't know what happens to the time. It's like It seems like five minutes ago, it was 4.30 in the morning, and now it's 5.30 in the afternoon, 6 o'clock, and um, I'm just having a blast. <laughs> so anyway, let's take a look at the next verse in the Mandukya Upanishad Karika, the uh, commentary by Shankaracharya is just amazing. Check this out. Tasma devang viditvai nam advaite yojayet smritim advaitam samanu prapya jadavallo kamacharet. Therefore, knowing the Atman to be such indeed, develop mindfulness of non duality. Having grasped non-duality, one should prefer to pass through the world like a dumb fool. <laughs> this is great. Um, okay, Tasmat. Therefore, this refers back to the last two or three shlokas, where he's talking about the nature of the Atman. This manifold does not exist as identical with Atman, nor does it ever stand independent by itself. It is neither separate from Brahman, nor is it non-separate. <laughs> the wise, who are free from attachment, fear, and anger, who are well versed in the meaning of the Vedas, verily realize this Atman as totally devoid of all imaginations, such as prana, etc., free from the illusion of the manifold, and non-dual. So those who understand and realize Atman in this way develop mindfulness of non-duality. Well, only they can develop mindfulness of non-duality because only they actually understand what it is. Most of the people who talk about non-duality treat it as if it's an object of understanding. But in the Kata Upanishad it is clearly stated, and several other Upanishads, that Brahman is never the object of any actions, including understanding, reason, consciousness, etc. Why is that? Brahman is the knower. Atman, the self, it's never the other. It's always oneself. But not oneself as an ego, not oneself as a, an empirical individual, but oneself as pure being, consciousness, and bliss, sat chit ananda So Brahman is never something you see. Ramana Maharshi used to say, you cannot see Brahman, you can only be Brahman. So, aham brahmasmi. <laughs> Once you reach that point, there's, there's no turning back, no going back to being an individual. The jig is up. <laughs> so having grasped this, I mean, literally, the word is uh, advaitang samanu prapya, grasping with the hand. Uh, once you got it, once you actually get it, jada valo kamacharet. Jada. Jada means a dumb person. Right? I guess these days we would call them a cognitively challenged or differently abled <laughs> or dumb. <laughs> no, jada means in this context someone who deliberately decides not to talk about this non-duality and not try to share 
what is already shared and not try to make people understand what cannot be understood. This is the closest equivalent I've seen in Vedas of the Chinese saying by Lao Tzu that he who knows does not speak. He who speaks does not know. He who speaks about the unspeakable is a fool. There's only one situation where it is not a foolish thing to do, and that is out of compassion. If out of compassion, one cannot tolerate to see the beings suffering in the world because one knows that actually Brahman is free from suffering, is liberated, and is never subject to duality. So one who speaks out of that motivation is certainly not a fool, but is acting out of love. And this has always been our motivation, because really, the thing that was driving us for many years was the tension between what we could see in the world and what we felt inside as the reality. And trying to resolve this tension has been a lifelong process of understanding and self-realization. So after many, many years, finally, this tension is resolved. It resolved when Shiva invited me to merge with him, and I just merged into his existence. So now that tension, that was the personal reason that was driving me to attain or seek self-realization. But now there's another reason that's driving me to share about it, which has really always been the motivation behind my attempts to share, and that is compassion for the suffering conditioned beings in illusion in the material world. It's very hard to like walk down the street and see people who are suffering. And knowing that they could be released from that suffering, relieved from that suffering, simply by changing their point of view simply by changing the way they look at things. You know, it's, it's so easy once you know how. But grasping, as it says here, Advaita Yoja Yet Smritim, developing the mindfulness of Advaita, and then Samanu Prapya, grasping it, actually getting it in your hand, possessing it. Uh, this is not easy. Uh, this takes a lot of work and a lot of study, a lot of knowledge, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of meditation. So you have to be willing to do the work, to do the study. I can talk about it. I can introduce the ideas. But because, as we can see by the comments, <laughs> there's always some misunderstandings, and it can be quite subtle. So actually one has to approach a personal spiritual guide, someone who can uh, test your understanding and explain where you have missed, because you certainly will miss in the beginning. And we see in the Upanishads, for example, the story of Shveta Ketu. He approaches his guru and the guru has to explain again and again <laughs> This is Brahman. This is what the Brahman means. This is what non-duality is. This is the meaning of the self, and so on and so on. He has to explain so many times. And of course, that is simply um, a digest, a condensation of the complete conversation, which can take years, you know, and it should, it must, if you are really going to get it because there's so many little details, so many pitfalls on the path where it's easy to go astray and go wrong and lose the thread. 
And we see it. We see it happen again and again. So out of compassion, if one uh, does not speak, then he becomes like ungrateful. Because after all, he was able to attain through the compassion of others. So it's our duty then to pass that along, pay it forward, and uh, repay our masters who took so much trouble to help us awaken by passing on the same thing to others. So, but if not, you know, let's say uh, that it's an extremely unfavorable time or circumstance or something like that, and it's just not appropriate to talk about it, then what? Well, then one should remain jada. There's a nice story in Srimad Bhagavatam about Jada Bharat. Bharat was the great king of India, after whom actually the country of India is named. You look at the money. It's not called India, it's called Bharata. Bharata means the country of King Bharata. So Bharat, after his uh, lifetime as a great king, he retired and he became a sadhu in the woods. And while he was in the woods, he saw a female deer give birth to a young uh, fawn and then die after childbirth. So out of compassion, he started to take care of the fawn. And he became so attached to this little fawn, so affectionately attached, that at the last stage of his life, he was thinking of the fawn. Oh, if I die, who will take care of the fawn? As a result, he became a deer in the next life. Because as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, the state of being that one conceives at the time of death is the consciousness that one attains in the next life without fail. So out of attachment to the deer, he became a deer. But he remembered his past life on account of being a yogi. So he simply came near to a hermitage where the monks were chanting mantras and praying and so on. And he took their association and just ate dry leaves and so on uh, until he left the deer body. And then the next body, he was born in a Brahmana family. But since he remembered his previous lives, he said, uh, I'm not going to get caught up in all this institutional religion and karma yoga rituals and social conventions and all of this nonsense. I'm simply going to pretend to be dumb. Jada. And so he was known as Jada Bharat. So he was considered useless. His father tried to teach him, but couldn't get anywhere with him. So he just put him out with the cows. You know, hey, just watch the cows, okay? <laughs> Jada. <laughs> so one day the king, Rahugana, was coming through that area, and one of his um, palanquin bearers became ill. And so they recruited Jada Bharat to help because he's a strong guy, a young, strong guy, and not too smart, as, as everyone thought. So they were carrying the palanquin with the king, but Jada Bharat wouldn't step on any ants or other little creatures on the road. So, you know, this was jostling the king and he became disturbed. And he finally, he said, stop, everybody stop, get down. And he started chastising Jada Bharat. What are you doing? What's the matter with you? <laughs> and for the first time in his life, he spoke. And he spoke so intelligently about the nature of beings and consciousness and compassion and nonviolence and all of this. King Rahugana was very struck by the intelligence of this apparently dumb man. So he made him his personal advisor. 
And Jada Bharat then became one of the cabinet members, the, like the spiritual advisor to the king. So just because one acts Jada as a dumb fool, it doesn't mean that one is actually like that. But he may be a deep renunciant. He may be uh, an avaduta, one who doesn't care anything for the material world. Because only such a person who sees that the material world is simply an illusion, simply an appearance in the mind, only such a person can really be happy because he has attained the highest level of self-realization. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.